sir. So, and I want to say this bottom line up front as well. So we talked about the active component. There's a major gap there as well. So right now, the only, there's a CA brigade, and we'll go more into it, that handles all our soft brothers. Now you got the 83rd CA Battalion that's right now the only active duty CA Battalion. That's going away in 2004. So what you're going to see here in this room, there's a great potential. You're going to go back to your organization. You're going to have more civil experience than most people in your formation. You might get tapped to be that G9 if you know the boss says, hey, it's a capability that I, I need within my organization. So I want you to go ahead and consider that. So we got a lot of people long in the tooth here in the room, and we have a lot of people experience with CIMIC, our NATO allies and brothers. So uh, your experience with CA, a coin hangover was perfect. I Love that analogy. I'm going to use that moving forward. What are some experiences with CA here in the room? Uh, soccer ball guys, candy guys. What's some stuff that you guys have seen overseas? Let me get, and I'm not going to be offended, but what's the, what's the respect of the CA overseas? <laughs> Sir. A couple of times I'm calling you live on the like, outreach to so specifically where the Russians are uh, conducting outreach in some of the countries. There's also a CA presence that's doing the equal and opposite kind of thing. Yes, sir. That's good. Anything else? Experience to see overseas, your guys' experience, good and bad. How do you guys see us as a branch, as a capability? How are we seen? What I'll say is this, more times than not, most folks that I'll talk to, they look at us either a couple different buckets, but we're doing our own thing, we're not integrated with the command, or you know, we're phase four focused. All we care about is stability. So what I want to say is, the way that we see the fight now, it's a little tough to see, I'll cut the lights. That's good. Thanks. So... In my CMOC, this is the way that I saw the fight. And I would look at everything that we're doing, all the civil affair operations. Is it supporting the maneuver commander? Is it supporting his maneuver to meet his objectives? And I want to look at that. I want to maintain his resources. I want to maintain his combat power. I want to ensure operational reach within uh, the area of operation. So that's my goal. Now, whether that's getting IDPs out of the area, where that's trying to make sure that I can keep the civilian populace in support of coalition forces, so your G-locks aren't compromised and you move forward to the next objective. But that's my intent with everything that I do. Every operation that we do needs to be nested with that commander and with his intent. I wanna go over the terms here that we're gonna talk throughout the presentation. The biggest thing I wanna highlight is our NATO partners, so CIMIC. So civil military cooperation. The next fight is gonna be all hands on deck. It's gonna be a group event. We're gonna need all the support of everybody that we have. CIMIC is gonna be incredibly important. So as we talked about before, active duty, uh, US Army right now, it's limited. The Marine Corps, they have some active duty for the MEF, but it's also very small, about 160 uh, Marines total. So we're gonna have to work with all our allies, all our support. Uh, the Dutch, Apple Bowden, they've got a good CIMIC or CMI team that's operating down there. And they also have a national team that's kind of a, a QRF of CIMIC, so to speak, currently right now working in NATO, and I'll go more into that as well. So going down here, ECHO, European Civil Protection Humanitarian Aid Operation. So what ECHO is, it's a NATO operation that brings all the resources that NATO can bring to the table. Every country, every NATO partner has talked about what kind of resources they can bring. You look in Ukraine right now, they've already spent about 1.28 billion euros as of date. So they're very active, they're a very good resource, they're a good friend to have at the table. You guys are familiar with our terminology, so Civil affair operation versus civil military operation. So CAO is something that a G9 will do, or a 38 Alpha or a 38 Bravo will do as a CA uh, professional. CMO is anything that's related with that command. Now I'll go more into the case study uh, with Colonel Dean with what 4th CAG had done in Fallujah, but it's a great example. So he said, you know what, we were the spark plugs, you know, the MEF and basically RCT-7, they were the engine. So CMO activity, the engine, you know, that infantry battalion, that infantry battalion commander having the mindset and the open mindedness to want to go ahead and have civil consideration within his, his, uh, his operations. He was the engine that got all the effects. Without him, we couldn't have done it. Civil reconnaissance. This is our bread and butter of all we do. So our job really is to map human terrain and infrastructure terrain to see how that's going to affect the maneuver commander. We're doing that from day one. We're doing it throughout the entire operation. If we continually update it. I'll talk more, Brian, we'll talk about what's called the civil knowledge integration, which is kind of the new SIM. We'll put all that stuff into a database after we've kind of analyzed it and pass it off to the S2 and all the appropriate parties. The CMOC, kind of the brain of our operation. So the first thing when I get on ground, after I've integrated and I've got in with the staff, the next thing I'm gonna do is make sure that my CMOC is operational. That's gonna have basically a, a hub. I can have host nation, I can have IGOs, NGOs meet there. I can get as much information as I can. I'm gonna go ahead and take that information and then give that to a product that you guys can use for the maneuver commander. Dislocated civilians, that's our terminology. 
but we're going to use IDP, internally displaced persons. That's the NATO terminology. That's what we're going to use moving forward here for this course. UAPs, United Action Partners. Yes, sir. Just real quick, the refugees, IDPs, can you draw that distinction, please? Yes, sir. So a refugee, basically, they're from another country coming over. So, for example, um, Afghanistan and the folks that were, you know, fleeing Afghanistan for political reasons, whatever it is, and they're coming to the United States. They're refugees. IDPs are within their own country. Uh, the battle space, a war, a conflict, uh, criminal organizations, corruption, lack of water resource, whatever that reason is, has shifted that population within their own country. They want to go back to their village. They want to go back to their towns and their homes. How do we get them back there safely and securely? Okay, UN OCHA, uh, UM SIM cord. So basically, we'll talk more about the IGOs, IGOs, OGAs, all these different three-letter acronyms. They're the coordinators. So consider them the the parachute, and everybody else is kind of the risers under, underneath, et cetera. They're the ones kind of holding up that system. Yes? For CIMIC, is that just a term for the, the actions taken between civil military, or is there like a like contractual uh, like feedback that, that is covered under that as well? Very good question. So CIMIC, consider CIMIC like a, a CAD-A team, like a civil affair team. So CIMIC basically, and honestly, the Europeans, NATO does it a lot better. So a CIMIC team is comprised, they'll have their PSYOP, They'll have some governance folks. They'll have a command structure. So basically think of it as the command structure of civil affair in our NATO ally partners. And that will conduct civil military interaction, uh, CMI, et cetera. But if you look at it, so in the, where, that's a good point. What I love what CIMIC does is they have their PSYOP and their CA together all in one and they nest it. So information operations and civil affair operations can be nested. It's a much more effective model. And that's actually we're in a white paper, I think, for the U.S. Army. It's something we've got to look at as well for the Marine Corps. Second Battle of Fallujah. So can somebody in the room kind of give me a basic rundown of the first Battle of Fallujah? I know we talked about it a little bit this week. Just kind of the wave top highlights. Blood the base, punch in the face. Yeah. So long and the short of it, Baghdad's the big show. So um, for us to Baghdad, oh, yes, sir, in the back, please. No, I'm there, so I guess I could probably do Oh, God bless her. Microphone? <laughs> uh, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. It's definitely a good way to cops. Yes, sir. Oh, microphone here, sir, if you want that. Yeah, so the bottom line is, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't know is there was a couple of shootings. <laughs> there were a couple of shootings that took place uh, prior to prior to Baghdad exploding or, and uh, the, the whole country exploding and the contractors getting killed. Um, the, the 3rd ACR had an incident where they killed 13 guys. Uh, 13 Iraqis uh, in Fallujah. That was immediately followed by the uh, the Marines killing 13 guys. And you know, coincidentally, they also killed 13 guys. The the uh, Blackwater uh, contractors went for whatever reason went through Fallujah. They got uh, we all know they got killed and strung up on the uh, on the bridge. So the decision was made that that uh, that the Marines would go in there and we would clean up clean up uh, Fallujah. Um, we did, we planned it for three days, executed, I think it was, if I remember right, it was 7th Marines came in from, um, came in from Al-Assad, 1st Marines came in from, uh, from actually Camp Fallujah, which is right, located right outside the town, and there were elements from the 1st Brigade, 1st Infantry Division that were in support of the operation. Um, it was going actually very, very well, but something I got to take a step back. I was the PSYOP company commander. Mm -hmm. So I was given the mission of getting people out of Fallujah. So getting civilians out of Fallujah. We started dropping leaflets. I had a radio station, actually two radio stations. Uh, it was going actually very well. The, the civilians were coming out where we were telling them to come out and they were doing what we were telling them to do. We were working with the civil affairs guys oh, geez, sir. Um, to handle the, the roughly 70 grand that came out. Uh, they were, they were, Going to set up a camp, ended up not really needing a camp because they almost all went to Baghdad. Um, go into the city. Uh, I think we were doing combat operations for three or four days, and we were told to hold what we've got uh, because it was hitting the, the news. And I, I think on, on Monday, I talked about Al Jazeera was a real pain in the ass. Al Jazeera was getting messages out of Fallujah, even though Fallujah was basically surrounded. Uh, they were getting they were getting uh, video out that was not very complimentary of our efforts. The, the
doing a wonderful job. They were not indiscriminately killing people. They were they were killing bad guys. Doesn't really matter when uh, you know pictures of dead people start showing up on uh, on international news. The uh, National Command authorities decided it was time to to stop what we did. Right. Yeah. So. Yep, that's great. That was a good way to top thing. Yeah, and hey, round of applause. Round of applause, honest. Thank you for your service, sir. So, the, uh, so the point, Thank so you, sir. Two points I want to bring out there. This was in 2004, right? Before Thanks. everybody Thank left you. home, right? So, again, he said you know, there was stuff coming out that he couldn't control, a narrative he couldn't control in there, right? Um, you know, we're, we're trying and doing the right thing. So, there, there's a good point in that. And the second thing is what started it all. Right, killing civilians. Right, so there's that, there's that, there's that edge that we find ourselves on. Right, it's very difficult to do our job without killing civilians. But when you do kill civilians, it starts a cycle of violence that you may not be able to control. So, um, the two very great points that came out of that. But the, the the real big picture thing I think is that we started and then we had to stop. No, thank you, sir. And appreciate that. I'll definitely be coming back for some more questions. So. The CAG did an incredible job with the Battle of Fallujah, the PSYOP as well. So between information operations, PSYOP, and the CAG, once again, they did a great job. So we're gonna talk more about this here. So this is what's a little network of sewer lift pumps. So this is where this kind of comes into story for the fourth CAG. So they're doing clearing operations. Uh, the battle is going forth. They start on 7 November 2004 is when the battle actually initiates. During the battle, four or five days in, Tim General uh, Tim Nantonsky goes to the CAG and says, hey, I've got a major water issue in this area. Now my track can get in, but my DC-9 dozers can't. We're having flooding issues. The Marines can't clear that area. Possible IEDs, dead bodies. It's getting kind of a toxic area. So we need to get that water out. Now, the CA team had done a great job when they first hit ground and they got their CMOC operational. It was a huge lesson learned. They integrated well, they had a good CMOC. So they were able to get a lot of information from the actual area, from different folks they were talking to, technocrats, et cetera. So when they got the order to go ahead and try to fix the problem, they went ahead and the CA guy did a great job. So Colonel D, he went ahead, he talked to a bunch of local Iraqis, and in his words, he basically did a, a just an appeal. You know, for God and for, uh, for Iraq and for the glory of Iraq, can somebody please come in my truck? I know there's shooting going on currently. I need help to go in the city and identify these pumps. One guy actually volunteered. Now, the big thing that helped out the CAT team to be effective was they had a map that was a, a local understood map. So instead of using RGRGs and all this and that, they had a map that had a common operating picture with the local nationals. He was able to get that gentleman in the truck. They drove around the entire city and they identified all these lift stations. So what they had was there was nine pump stations that had gotten damaged when they were doing the, the pre-fires, essentially, uh, prior to the operation kicking off. And they were connected in three pump nodes. And two or three of them were damaged. So they did an assessment. They had the CBs, incredibly effective. They had their own pumps. And they got the lift stations up. Now, 24 hours later, the CG goes, hey, the water's only gone down an inch. What the hell? You guys are supposed to solve my problem. So they go back out and they do an assessment. Now, and sir, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there were three bridges that went into Fallujah. So there was New Bridge, Old Bridge, and there was a Sluice Dam Bridge uh, where the dam was. So they take this bridge they typically don't take. Typically, it wasn't a very secured area, but they took it on this day. And as they're driving down, the CAT-A team leader looks at the dam and he looks at one of these rulers for uh, elevation or uh, water level marking, and it's at nine. And he's like, yeah, I'm not a water engineer, but that doesn't seem right. So he stops. He goes and talks and does a, a quick uh, key leader engagement, civil engagement with the guy running the dam. And he goes, you know what? I'm out of fuel. I've been out of fuel. I have the gate open for the mechanism to relieve water as best I can, but I can't fully crack it. Well, what's going to happen? Well, Fallujah's going to flood. Okay, what do you need? Well, I need some fuel. Cat A team leader, he calls back, and the S4 hooks it up. You know, they get a tanker out there with some fuel. You know, seven hours, 10 hours, everything is bone dry, and they were operationally able to start maneuvering in the city. So once again, it shows how you can utilize and leverage CA and SIAP to go ahead and try to leverage maneuver. So brief timeline, basically, of the operation. The biggest thing that I want to point out was their integration. They had done such a good job with that CMOC. They had a great network of players within the area, and that helped out both with lethal and non-lethal targeting. They were able to get interviews with folks. Now, technically, we don't do intelligence. That's a, a civil affair. The idea is trying to be open to the populace. We don't want to be seen as collectors. But they do a lot of information gathering, and that can be used in a, a variety of ways. They were basically given the order to go ahead and set the CMOC up within the city after the battle had subsided to start trying to stabilize the area. 
Now, the IDP activity was pretty amazing. And, sir, if you want to correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Sutherland, sir. So, uh, talking to Colonel D, there was about 1,000 people left in the city when battle uh, had initiated. I don't know if that's accurate from your foxhole at all. But they had done a very good uh, PSYOP campaign prior to the operation. As Sir had stated, try to get those IDPs out. When the battle had initiated, it was pretty minimal. Now, there's 50,000 homes in Fallujah, approximately. And the collateral damage, the BDA, which the CAT team did pretty immediately, was estimated at seven to 10,000 buildings. The other thing they did was this. When they set that CMOC up, they immediately got three FHA stations open up within the city. Uh, so uh, foreign humanitarian aid. Thanks, sir. So they had basically three stations set up with food, water, basic essentials. They were able to try to get that to the populace. Resource planning. The other really good thing they had done, just like the S4 is going to do for combat, for keeping uh, beans and bullets up at the front, for aid is the same thing. So they pre-planned aid near the front lines were able to get that in incredibly quickly once the battle had subsided and things had stabilized. Also very effective. So yes. just jump in here real quick. We're going to talk about logistics, but why is that food and, and other things coming in for civilians so important to us? Because it doesn't draw down on our own supplies. Because yeah. why would it draw down our own supplies? Yeah. Because we're responsible for it. We are responsible Correct. for international. So human, we, we, the military in that area, are responsible for taking care of the things that are under our control in that area. Right, Sahar? Yeah. We talked about the 2.5 days. So now, all of a sudden, that's just for conventional for our forces, for coalition force. We have to have some pre-planning as well for the civilian population. Uh, yes, sir. So for, for that portion of the operation, did you have some type of security force that was drawn from the maneuver side? And how did you coordinate that through the planning? So that's the thing. So you definitely always going to have some kind of a security element. Now, I'll, I'll kind of go more into it. I'm white papering a concept that I'm going to call the civil operations support team. And that's going to consist of, depending on the level, but essentially MPs, put the SIAP and the CA together because they do have gun trucks as well. MPs have some firepower as well. And then the humidors. So that we have more of a, a tailored unit that doesn't require so much from the combat force. Because the reality of it, Right. Keep going. Yes, sir. You're going to be busy. you got other things you have to worry about. Now, the coordination will be through the three channels, and obviously commander's intent, you know, whatever his objective is, he'll go ahead and pull resources, but typically that's how you'll do it. So typically what I do when I'm in command, I'll have my SIOP, my CA work together. That gives me some firepower right there, and then I'll work with that MP company commander to get some MP support, depending on my level. Right, and at the division rear, right, where a lot of this is going on in the division rear, and I just came back from being the king. I, my last job, I was the king of the rear. Right, so that's the mm -hmm. de de deputy commanding general for support. He's in charge of logistics and in charge of protection. Mm -hmm. And I got my right hand man there, right? So we got Lucas Kletke from the one for one Feb, my, my protection brigade, right? And these two guys were working together all the time because CA spends a lot of time in the rear doing what we need to do. Yes, they go forward, but a lot of that, once we seized an area, we got that civilians we need to take care of. So that's to your question. Where does all this come out of? There is a, um, there are forces that are allocated to the protection brigade in the division rear that I would pull out to do these other security missions. Sure. I'm not, I would have already pulled off people from, before the operation started, I've already got combat forces that I'm using for this. What sort of support are you, uh, are you asking for when you ask for increase? What, what are they providing? The reality of it for me, I want, you know, they're Mark 19s. I want to basically have some 50 cows. I want to have just some fire support. So the idea is this um, communication. We typically actually bring better communication. So a cat team's going to have SATCOM. They typically will have HF as well. So communication wise, I'm fine. I do want to have some extra firepower and the MPs are good with dealing with people. And that that's the difference, right? Is that it just so major collecty, maybe, you know, when you, we talk about protection, I want you to pop in and talk about how using MPs have special skill sets that infantry don't have. And so everybody thinks, well, it's in the rear, we'll give it to an MP. That's not true. And so MPs have special skill sets and have special organization that that's not something they need to worry about. Thank so you. let's move on from that. Okay. Point, though, let's talk about his protection. So the big thing I want to talk about here, just the top piece, and we'll kind of go lessons learned, the civilians returning. So the CAT team, another big thing they did, they had a really good plan with supported unit for reintegrating civilians into the battle space once they got back into Fallujah. It was a very tailored approach and it was very effective. Okay, so just kind of an example here, the sewage lift pumps. Once again, the issue was it was rain runoff, so the Euphrates had that bend. So you had basically a river runoff that was, you know, going in the city. It was lifting up a lot of the sewage, basically coming up from underneath, and then obviously creating kind of a toxic mess. So we've kind of gone through some of the highlights here of what they had done. Uh, 
they did an incredible job. I mean, truly, the Marine Corps was textbook on that. Other big thing, too, and this is more for my Army brothers on the CA side, we really get this uh, tunnel vision where we think that only the Army does civil affairs. The Marine Corps is an effective capability that does a job, just a very good job at what they do on the CA side. Once again, I can't harp on it enough. The next fight, it's going to be team partnership. We have to work with everybody and understand their language and how they operate. Okay, so lessons learned. The CAT team that went in there, the CAG that went in there, had done a lot of operation in the Balkans. They came in with this idea of humanitarian assistance. Major issue. When they hit ground the first couple weeks, all they were talking about was phase four stabilization. The commander said, that's beautiful. Uh, here's some crayons. You know, do me a favor. Go in the corner. I'll call you in a year. Come on back. They got the hint. They started looking at the battle space more effectively. They made sure to help out maneuver. They became a very big seat at the table. Staff integration, staff integration, staff integration, staff integration. Most critical piece of this whole fight. If you don't integrate, and if you guys don't allow us to come have a seat at the table, the operation's going to fail. You have to have civil consideration plan from the very beginning. Commander buy-in. I've got to understand how that commander thinks and what he wants. If I don't understand that, I'm dead in the water. I'm not going to do a thing for that commander. Soldiers, Marines are going to get hurt. Civilians are going to get hurt. I failed at my job. Once again, pre-positioning the FHA trains, incredible. CMOC, having that operational, that drove lethal and non-lethal targeting right from the very beginning. They understood the human terrain. They mapped that early. That helped out for a baseline for future operations. Screening fighters. One thing that uh, the word that I got was they had about 4,000 fighters that got out. Now, they did their best to screen them. Uh, they didn't have weapons. They didn't hit on bats and hides, and they put them in detention centers. But just bear in mind, that was a consideration on the back end. I don't know if there was a better way of doing that. They had the best intel they had, but that was a consideration for their part in the operation. The Band-Aids. So stuff's going to break. That's the reality of it. We go into that expecting that. What's going to be my backup solution? I'm not going to be able to do it on the fly. Everybody's got to fight somewhere in the battle space. Resources are constrained. What they did really well was they had generators ready and they had big water tanks ready. So as soon as the battle subsided and they got those centers up, they brought in Band-Aid power in certain parts of the city and they brought in as much water as they could for the population and refilled that daily. So at least people had the basic you know, necessity to go ahead and survive. Reintegrating basically host nation population. So what they did, they did a district approach. It was staggered. So they would say they'd work with PSYOP. The integration was incredible. Okay, civilians from Jolan, we've got everything band-aided as best we can. We've done our basic repairs. If you're from Jolan, you can come back in 48 hours, and they would reintegrate that portion of the city. So it was very controlled and staggered. That really minimized a lot of the chaos in the city when they were doing reintegration. Effective use of money as a weapon system. Money as a weapon system can be very effective. It can be very bad. It can have incredibly negative second and third order effects. It can also be very positive. They did a good job. So what they did was this. Any head of household for seven days and seven days only could go to one of those, uh, system, one of those centers for aid and could get $300. So 22,000 heads of households, about $6.6 .6 million worth of money within seven days got stimulated back into that economy. Within 24 hours, they had shops open, people were trading, and they had some business back up to help keep people afloat. Now, what they did was fraud can be an issue. So there's risk to that. People can double dip. They would stamp the ration cards the best they could. You know, it was effective. I'm sure some stuff slipped by, but for the most part, very effective. I'll talk more about how the Army did it. We failed at it. It was open. We didn't do a good job of accountability, and there was a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse, and accountability of where that money had gone. So the Marine Corps did a good job there. Uh, BDA, they were in there right off the bat. They were taking assessments while the shooting was going on. They were in making sure what was going on. The five R's, they basically had the right message at the right time. So kudos to PSYOP on that. They had the right people. They had the right tools. They had the right fix, and it was sustainable. That was the critical piece of it. We'll kind of talk more about projects and plans, but it has to be sustainable. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, this is really useful uh, I'm examining the recent evolution, and there's so many threads that we can elaborate on, but I just want to briefly mention a couple of things. Oh, the, yes, sir. The, the, the battle damage assessments. I mean, so the practice, when you have presence on the ground and if the area is accessible, the practice has been to go in and see what happens. But since then, that time, the trend has been 
to do BDAs just using your <laughs> ISRs and you will never get a complete picture of what really happened. So that's really important to, if you cannot access the area yourself, how you can leverage either working with host nation forces or leveraging information from NGOs who or organizations that are on the ground to better get it uh, to better inform your analysis of what happened after the fight. Um, the second issue, and thank you for mentioning screening of fighters, that's that's again not a phase four issue. It's happening in real time as. And, uh, and even in rec the recent conflicts in Syria and Iraq, there were so many challenges about screening because fighters were intermingling with the civilian population and you need to have properly trained people at the front lines who are screening for fighters having, you know, and you need to have men and women and that, and then where do they go? And then thinking through that. So there's a whole host of planning and all that. And the other issue is, I know I touched upon this yesterday in my lunch brief, you need to prepare or coordinate or get external support for the casualties that you're going to be receiving at the front lines. When people are crossing, uh, I mean, the, you've seen this in Ukraine, but also in other conflicts, people are going to get injured and I will have so much, the kind of injuries they're going to have, it's going to overwhelm you. So mm -hmm. you need to have the proper uh, uh, emergency response to either within your unit or bringing specialized uh, organizations who can provide emergency medical response to save lives. And there's going to be a lot of it. Again, the urban fight, buildings, you know, falling on civilians and soldiers or whatever, and the kind of fires that are going to be used, the, the medical and trauma care needs are going to be enormous. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so real quick, uh, take a minute, go over the definitions. So pretty much similar across the board, depending on whether it's US Army, Marine Corps or NATO. We're all in line. The idea is trying to go ahead and inform the population. We want to map human terrain, infrastructure to help out that maneuver commander and maintain initiative and operational reach. Okay, the importance of urban operation, once again, stuff's going to break. We know that's going to be a fact of it. Denied terrain. So urban operations, it's going to be denied, not to the locals. And for us, we can try to use sensors and get as much information as we can. That's going to help you guys plan your fight. Assessments, also critical. Freedom of movement, we'll go more into it, but obviously the idea of IDPs in the battle space, that's going to impede freedom of movement, second and third order effect. Loss of critical structure. So let's say Los Angeles, go back to the flight that we had going to Fort Irwin. Critical infrastructure, if we're planning that fight, I want you to think about this. What was the most, what was the most critical infrastructure that you guys had seen, in your opinion? What would affect Los Angeles the most? Which one? Water, 100%. There you go, sir. So California, Los Angeles, 62% of that city is imported water. So there's three main aqueducts. If the enemy took that out, that would affect 13 million people. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I was Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Mark Twain said, you know, people, uh, they drink whiskey and they fight over water. So <laughs> it's true. Okay, consolidated gains, G-lock. Same thing. Now, once again, we got basically not the urban triad. We're taking the NATO partnership with our four. If you look at it, civil consideration, information operation, three out of the four. So it's a big piece of the fight. You fail to consider it, you're going to fail in battle. Okay, so once again, our structure. I want to hit this on the CIMIC group. So I'll give you guys a minute to look over that. Uh, Captain Sims kind of answering your questions too for the CIMIC. So this is basically a QRF of CIMIC and NATO. So it's run by the Italians currently. They're heading it. And these are the partner countries that are currently participating in it. They've got five action companies right now that can operate and deploy. So that's an incredible resource. Once again, U.S. Army, we're limited in manpower. If the war kicks off, our attrition is going to be minimal. And obviously, we're going to have to go ahead and rely on everybody that can come to the fight, including our NATO brothers and sisters. U.S. Marine Corps force structure. So the CAG and the MEF, MEF's going to have their active component right now. Uh, the Commandant back in 2019 put active duty uh, CA back into the MEF. Approximately 67 Marines in each MEF. 179 uh, Marines with each one of the CAGs. And once again, we highlighted 4th CAG. Uh, incredible warriors, uh, great Marines. They did a lot for the good. Once again, Sir talked about it this morning. I kind of hit it as well. We're screwed in a year. <laughs> I'm just honest. We're going to be totally screwed. The Army failed to learn. When OAF and OEF kicked off, what did we do? We stood up another brigade of CA. Took a lot of time and resources. Okay, the war ended, what did we do? We consolidated, we brought them down, made them smaller and smaller. I was hoping the 83rd was gonna stick around for a while. Uh, I was talking to my commander last night, they're going in 2004. So what does that mean? Captain Sims, you know, SFAB experience, he's been in this course. 
2024, sir. Could be the next G9. It's very possible. So we got to see now when the war kicks back up, KPOC is going to go ahead and take the brunt of it again. So the issue here is, you know, we do our best to try to go ahead and fill and man. You know, we have our pipeline issues as well. Once again, when the war kicks off again, I mean, in the height of OIF and OEF, we had about a year and a half of dwell time and we were back over. So the average CA reservist would have about an hour, year and a half at home. You know that year and a half and Serena, you could speak on it. You'd have a year and a half at home. You'd go to NTC or your train up, primo, and then you're back out the door. I, mean, I was a 315th and I mean, I literally had a 24 year old staff sergeant at three deployments as a reservist. Uh, so you wanted to highlight something? <laughs> They said, that they, had, they said that they had a year and a half dwell time. The reality is they were gutting units to create new units because the, the retention was horrible. You know, so these guys, these guys were actually gone more than the active duty guys. The, the SIAP, and the same thing on the SIAP, SIAP side. too, sir. Uh, the, the SIAP company that, that I replaced, my company was in on the invasion. We were replaced by a, by a reserve SIAP company. Uh, they, were, they were mobilized for two years. They sat at Fort Bragg, North Carolina for 13 months before they ever went anywhere. So they were poorly, use of KPOC, uh, you know, lost the bubble on how to, how to properly handle these guys. And so, the, again, retention was horrible. You were doing instant CA units from guys that were going to a two week course. Same thing goes with SIOP. It was, it was bad. Bad attrition, sir. And that's going to be the reality in the next fight as well. So once again, it goes back to the idea we have to be a team. We've got to have a family approach and all that we do or we're going to fail. So we talked more about it yesterday. Uh, so IGOs, NGOs, OGAs, uh, USAID. So I'll hit it real quick on the wave top. So the NGOs. Start, start with acronyms and explaining them. Yes, sir. Get the wave top, yes, sir. So intergovernment organization. So we'll focus on the UN for the most part. UNHCR, handling humanitarian aid. UNICEF, handling food. World Health Organization. So the big intergovernment organizations, typically with uh, the United Nations. Okay, on the other government organization or activity. So basically other government agencies, OGAs. You'll have Department of Justice, FBI, DEA. They'll be out in the battle space. Department of State as well. Now, we spoke about USAID. So USAID was formed November 3rd, 1961, as kind of a, to put pressure on the communists to go ahead and put money out in the battle space. Now, USAID in 1999 became an independent agency. Now, they take direction from state. Now, state's budget is approximately 60 billion a year. AIDS is 30 billion out of that. Now, they're typically looking at more long-term projects, five-year projects. Uh, their stories, you know, they might be more based in Iraq and Afghanistan. They want to do a lot of uh, kind of short term projects, but they're more looking long term. They're very effective in that manner. Access, they have some good access. Some countries might limit their access. That's a capability you have to consider as well. Now, non government organizations, they're in the battle space, they're massive. They're going to be all over the place. Now, the point with them, they have to maintain neutrality to maintain their safety. So us using terms like partnership, stuff like that, is something that they don't want to hear. Now, they, they want to do good work. Now, there's some that are more action oriented, some that are more educationally oriented. What's critical is understanding their motivation and what their capability is to bring to the fight. So uh, Office of uh, Coordination Humanitarian Activities, so OCHA is gonna be kind of the, at the core level, at the theater level, coordinating with a lot of these different organizations. And I, as the commander, I'm gonna come up with a sync matrix for all the NGOs and IGOs in my battle space so I can understand, hey, they're operating here. One, duplication of efforts, and then more importantly, I don't want them getting hurt in case of kinetic operation. So we'll share information with them in regards to, let's say, a major operation and kind of coordinate. And then for IDP activities, you know, they're invaluable. They can bring doctors without borders, different people that can go ahead and provide some care and resource. Yes, sir. Just a question. Are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you, where does civic fall? Can you go back? Yeah. Where does civic fall into that? Uh, so, okay, we, can you explain what civic is, please? Oh, so uh, we are not a humanitarian aid organization. I might go over 10 minutes. We're not okay. advising and engaging yes. with militaries on good practices to mitigate civilian harm during operations and before, before during, and after. So we will be in this space, but more meeting with uh, either in a training uh, phase or doing a training with a local military or with our, or trying to meet with the commander to raise concerns that we have seen in terms of civilian harm. Uh, so that is sort of our sort of role during the battle. I mean, during the whole OIR campaign in Iraq, I was meeting with coalition commanders pretty frequently sharing information that I had seen and where their areas of improvement. Uh, just one thing about the NGO space, 
you know, it is shocking again these days. But all these organizations suddenly arrive, and you're like, who are you? Sometimes we, you know, um, sometimes the the host nation also doesn't know or is in such desperate need because they do not have the resources uh, to provide food, water, shelter. And then suddenly people come with their own agendas and religious views, etc. So you see whole dynamic situation. So I think it's very important, as Mazi was saying, is that at least on the humanitarian coordination, you know, the military needs to coordinate and have that sim cord approach. And then the UN OCHA is sort of at least the coordinating body for the organizations that are providing humanitarian assistance. But that having that military and, you know, somebody senior level coordinating with OCHA on this is important because you need that for your deconfliction. Because NGOs operate in an environment where they're providing food, water, shelter, and you don't want to be, you know, blowing up their mm. vehicles, etc. So knowing the GPS locations of where these organizations and hospitals have been set up is very important. Thank you, ma'am. And that's the sink court, once again, a sink matrix. And I mean, it's kind of a, it's a cop. You're going to have basically a, a cop, you know, for all civil consideration NGOs operating in the area. And that's going to be on me to go ahead and produce that and obviously hire up, you know, for core and all the G9s and S9s. Cop is common operating. Common operating picture. Thanks, sir. So task organization, we talked a little bit about it with Captain Sims. So the cost team is not a doctrinal term yet. I'm working with doctrine to go ahead and get that added. That's a good way forward. It minimizes a lot of the impact and resources that you know, Maneuver has to go ahead and provide. And then and once again, we started with our doctrine now in 19. You're going to have a civil affairs task force. It's now part of our, our mission essential metal tasks. So our, our basically essential task list. That got stood up. Now they're looking at it where phase four, phase five, you know, that CA task force could be potentially a landowner, depending on operations. Okay, so the pillars of it. We've kind of talked about it. Integration is the most critical piece. I can't hit that enough. My job day one when I hit ground is to get with that maneuver, get with the ops, so, you know, get with the commander and find out what their intentions are and their objectives are for the area. I've got to integrate. My CMOC has to be operational. So the Civil Military Operations Center has to be operational from day one. That's why I'm getting all my information that helps me map human terrain and infrastructure from day one to help drive operations. That's going to be throughout all the different staffs. So the S4, G4, G2, S2. I need to bring my game to all these working groups. I need to do a good running estimate before I get into theater. I need to basically do my civil reconnaissance at home station. Look at MarSims that the Marine Corps has. Palatier, if I can, with the, the soft side of it. Gather all the information that I can so I've got some kind of a baseline idea when I get into theater. And like all of us, we're going to update those running estimates throughout the entire fight. That's critical. Yes? So, so your CMOC at a brigade level, and I probably should know this, but I don't. What mission command system do they use or platform do they use or do they have one? Um, and then second part of that, if you're interacting with NGOs, IGOs, everything like that, should for planning considerations in a talk have a separate location to where there's unclassified uh, or it can be unclassified or sterile area uh, to bring those um, partners in uh, to, and then obviously not walk into the the and all that stuff. No, 100%. So what you'll do, we'll talk more about on placement. So urban operation, we'd have kind of more of a either a rolling CMOC that's in the back of an LMTV that's rolling, or you'd have a storefront. But once again, that's a very good point. So like Battle of Fallujah, they had that CMOC. So outside Camp Fallujah, uh, I would say, and sir, you were there I, maybe a, a mile down the road, however far, the CMOC was away from the actual FOB itself. So it's kind of more of that welcome center where you can have host nation come in, you're not compromising. At a brigade level, so CPCE is going to get fielded next year but they'll have JCP or JPCP. They're gonna have their Blue Force Tracker. They're gonna have SATCOM. They're gonna have high frequency. They'll have SINGARs. So the way that we do it now is I'm gonna have essentially two Humvees and a LMTV. I'm gonna operate my CMOC out of the back of that LMTV. And then I'm gonna have, uh, for just fail safe, I'll have a, a Blue Force Tracker up that can get comms well with my teams. And then myself as the commander, if, you know, if I was at a company, I would be basically going in and being that S9 at that brigade. Yes, but no, no special, so JPCP, it's the standard across the board, no special like D6A version or No, nothing like that. Nope. CA. Nope. So CPCE, hopefully get filled that next year. We'll see how that plays. Uh, that'd be the extent of it currently. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, one of the things that a lot of the CA uh, units in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Bosnia, first of all, they had civilian cell phones because the NGOs can't talk to them. Mm -hmm. So they would use the civilian cell phones and go to the opposite I got it. Hmm. You've got to be able to talk to your, to your uh, customers. 100%, sir. 
Harry, yes, sir. I'd say you also use a dirty internet, this and that, because you're engaging with locals, government, and everything. So it's a challenge, right? Okay. 100%. I do think there's some really interesting lessons that we've identified looking at OIR and also what's happening in the Ukraine context in terms of the signal coordination. Uh, yeah. So drawing those lessons, we wrote a paper uh, and we had a lot of the, the U.S. military civil affairs teams participate and feed into some of the learnings from Mosul and Raqqa. So it's on our website, we can share it. It's really interesting. So, I mean, we have, you know, it's improved significantly. Uh, the challenge sometimes, of course, is when you have some actors who, uh, you know, will use the GPS location of a humanitarian organization providing assistance and bomb it. We've had that. So trust is very important in this interaction with the NGOs, etc. It's very important to build trust in order for information sharing to happen. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, just across, I think the trust is a great thing to hit, uh, man. I, yeah. Trust is the most important thing in everything we do. I mean, that's within the organization, within our NATO partners, our brothers and sisters across the formation. So the big piece here that I want to kind of highlight of all the pillars to have good, effective CEO and support of the commander objective. So the war gaming piece, we're going to bring that to the table to go ahead and help out that commander. So for example, let's go Eastern Europe. If we're uh, going to Ukraine in that area on the S4 side, that S4 might go, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get logistics by rail, good method, right? But then I'm gonna to go to that guy and go, you know what, hey, I've already done a good job. My team has done a good job on the infrastructure assessment. You're not gonna be able to use that rail. A lot of Eastern Europe, you know, bits seen the, you know, the old Soviets, the rail gauge is a lot smaller. So it's not gonna match up with the EU rail system. So, okay, cool. You've got however many boxcars of stuff to get to the front line. Okay, you're gonna to get to a part in Poland or Lithuania. How are you gonna offload it and reconfigure it? Okay, well, you know what, Lithuanians are doing a project right now for, you know, 30 kilometer more of a rail line to bypass that. I've gotta be able to bring that to the fights so they can understand that. And then once again, updating the cops, very important. You gotta understand what's going on real time in the battle space. I need to make sure that I'm putting IDPs on that board, that my icon's on there so you can see what's going on in the battle space for maneuver and then for civilian consideration. The other piece of that as well, the working groups. Targeting working group is my favorite working group. If I can go to just one working group, that's what I'm doing. I'm not going to the civil military, you know, operation working group, non-lethal. I wanna to go to, to lethal targeting. Uh, yes, sir. What was that working group again? So the uh, targeting working group. So the reason why I want to go to the targeting working group, I want to work with the targeteers and find out how I can help out the fight. I want to help de-conflict and I want to help out with lethal fires if that's what they need as well. And my goal is to get civilian consideration as appropriate on that H pedal, that high payoff target list as appropriate. And then make sure that air tasking order, that I'm synced in with that, I understand what's going on. So I'm a you know CA guy and I want to do an operation in this area and I had planned it, but you know what, 12 hours, the phase line shifted. And you know what, they're going to be starting to do operations in that area. Okay, I got to adjust. But if I don't understand what's going on, my cop is screwed up. I'm not going to be value added to the organization. Yes, sir. Just so, not everybody here is in the in a division, but that is the lifeblood, the targeting life cycle, the daily targeting battle rhythm is the lifeblood of a division, right? A division fights in the future with okay. fires and aviation, and that takes coordination. We're trying to shape for the brigades underneath us. So that targeting working group is our daily battle rhythm of getting everything ready. Everything feeds into it. And he's right that if, if anybody, any staff section can only make one meeting, that's the one thing where we try to bring it all together is actually in the targeting working group, which may sound weird for some of you maneuver bubbles, but the division is a fires focus and aviation focus. And we leave that maneuver stuff to the ADCO, the operations general, and the BCT commanders that are going down for it. But we're trying up at the division level to get that. So he's right. And making sure he's also standing up and deconflicting but that's where the division commander is presented with a list of targets 72 hours to 96 hours out and saying, in 72 to 96 hours, ma'am, or sir, this is what we're going to target. This is what we're going to do, et cetera. He needs to understand where this thing is going, particularly on the kinetic side. Hmm. Thanks, sir. Yeah, we actually released the uh, daily travels uh, as a result of what comes out in the target decision board. Um, the updates, the matrix, the updates, the ATO, the targets, the matrix. Yeah. Right. And that's the piece that I didn't understand yeah, before I came to division is that division is a fires, a fires and aviation. And if you're doing deep attacks every night, right, um, uh, fires and aviation focus, deep focus, right? And that's how it goes. Sir, can I just separate those two out? One, you've got a targeting working group where a little bit more sausage is getting made and we're deconflicting, we're making sure everything works. 
the board is where the final decision gets made. Thank, approved. thank you. Yeah. You're right. I'm talking. I'm conflating those two. That's a good point. I see them as the targeting life cycle, right? And so what he's talking about, again, not to get too deep into division operations, targeting working group is where a lot of sausage is made at the staff level. The targeting board is where the boss approves the plan for, and then that kicks out those frag orders that are going down, hitting the daily, at least daily frag order that's going down to the brigades, and that's where they're getting. So, um, but again, just a caveat, that's in large scale combat operations out in, the, out in the woods, right? Is it beyond the pale that we would have strategic and battle rhythm compression to the point where we're doing two target working groups, two, two targeting cycles per day. And, and, and I see the G2's eyes rolling back in his head because it's so hard just at a once a day level of it's, it's, it, being on, we call it the hamster wheel, right? It's very difficult. Think about how hard it would be to do that twice a day, right? Twice, once every 12 hours to, to make the sausage, get the approval, execute the thing and keep on going. Sir. Great point. And he needs to send the deputy to the non-lethal fires targeting working group that feeds into the Correct. targeting working group that feeds into the board. Because the non-lethal, there's no many actors. It does. Cool. And then my thing is I need to be coordinating with everybody across the board prior to these meetings. If I'm doing my work, that's critical. And I know what the left and right hand's doing. I'm value adding when I come to the table because I'm paying attention. I understand what's going on in the fight. I just have one question. Yes, I know it's not a targeting club, but I mean, in a... Uh, in, is the assumption that um, for 50, or there going to be 50 50 deliberate versus dynamic targeting, or is it going to be? You have to, you have to change. If you're moving through, like on a war fight, is a good example of that. As you're moving through the rural, it's all mm -hmm. three hands, yeah. hands, then the tragic will do the reactors and the execute. As you get to <clears> the urban environment and you move on to the HPTs, then a lot of it becomes much more dynamic. Sounds good. Okay, so on phasing. So once again, integration is critical. Integration through all phases of the operation is critical. So as we're shaping, deterring, it's essential to have CR. I've got to have basically reconnaissance. I've got to start mapping the human and the infrastructure terrain. I've got to do that before I hit ground, and I've got to continue to update that. I need a baseline basically for that human domain. Am I are we angering people? Are we making uh, enemies we get on the ground? Are there sensors? What's that, sir? What's CR? CR? Civil reconnaissance. Like, so, civil reconnaissance. Once again, with that civil reconnaissance, that's critical from the gate. I've got to make sure that I'm doing that throughout the entire operation, especially before we hit ground. Once again, on the human domain side, uh, Stu had a great example talking about basically Ireland in the 60s. So when the, uh, you know, when the army arrived, the British army arrived, you know, they were looked at originally from the local nationals very positively. They were looked at as peacekeepers, you know, separating basically the Catholics and the Protestants. But they came in with more of a heavy-handed approach. And what happened? You had an elongated, protracted war. If they would have had a good baseline going in, understanding the local populace, and then seeing if things were ticking up and there were issues based on operations, they could have mitigated probably some issues in the future, I would say. I don't Stu, sir, if there's anything spot on, okay. Okay, we'll move on. Phase two and phase three. This is the Battle of Fallujah, great example. Seize and dominate. I'm making sure that humanitarian aid is up front. I'm making sure that I got a plan to fix stuff that breaks. How am I gonna help get the civilians back in the battle space safely? How am I gonna get them out of the battle space safely? And what am I gonna do with the folks who are gonna shelter in place and aren't gonna move regardless of what I say? Moving forward, stabilize civil authority. I can't be thinking about stabilization the moment I hit ground. I can't. I've gotta think about what the maneuver needs. As the fight progresses, I am backwards planning, but maneuver is my first focus to make sure that I can help that commander achieve objectives. And then we'll get in obviously civil authority and transition. But my goal, I don't wanna be in the business of running a country. We wanna pass that off and let the host nation once again run operationally. Okay, so Sledgehammer versus Scalpels. We talked about, let's say yesterday, the radio station. What is a way that I can help that maneuver commander achieve results in the best manner possible? Conserve resources, 
avoid you know having collateral damage and still achieve the same objective. I might have to destroy it. And you know what? That's fine. It's going to happen. What's my plan to go ahead and get it back up in operation if I've done the coordination? If we can scalpel it, can I use EW? Is there another way that I can go ahead and try to work it to get the same effect? Talked about this here. Uh, grandma, so the sensor. Very well, sir, could have been the CMOC. CMOC came in, a phone call with just a you know, box phone, or not box phone, basically just a, a, a local host nation phone, local network, or somebody coming into the CMOC and just giving information, giving tips. But that also comes down to the trust. If the populace doesn't trust me, they're not going to come in and share information. That's just the bottom line. Uh, we talked more, actually, so with, the, with Heinz Brothers, so the CMOC once again, you had the idea of kind of placing it away from the actual talk itself just for security purposes, uh, but still having the access to the host nation. Is that only at the division level, CMOC? No, CMOC all the way up. But picture this, so at a brigade level, CMOC is it's six guys. So you're going to have basically the commander, the first sergeant. They're going to have a, another major that runs a CMOC, but probably a captain. You'll have a public health, a, a mass sergeant, a public health NCO. You'll have a, a Seaburn guy, so you'll have a 74. You'll have a 25 to handle comms. So it's a pretty small group. Now, they're still... They're, quite important because they get a lot of that information from the ground and pass it up. You know, Ivory Towers, Division and Corps, it's okay, but I want to talk to the warfighter on the ground. So that Brigade CMOX is important as well. But a lot of your assets are going to be at the Division and the Corps is going to be incredibly robust. So you have about 77 packs at a, a, at a Division essentially for a headquarter, and that's going to be more robust to 110 packs up at the core level and with a, a myriad of capabilities. CMOC at Echelon, so uh, some acronyms here for us. So Civil Affair Planning Team do all the plans. They're the guys nugging out basically operational plans, support the commander. The Liaison Team, they're interfacing with everybody from IGOs, NGOs, host nation at that higher level. FXSP, so the Functional Specialty Team, that's going to be guys that are rule of law. They can be engineers, water engineers, all these different types of expertise. And the beauty with CA on the reserve side, real world, they do a lot of the stuff. He's a rule of law guy, but he's a detective with LAPD. He's a city planner for Dallas. You know, he's an engineer for, uh, for Google. And they'll bring a lot of its expertise as real world and it'll translate to the civilian population. What level is that? Uh, so you're going to have that at division. So you have that at division and you have that at core, not at the brigade level. So division and core and higher. Okay, Sim, I'll actually let Brian kind of talk. He's the expert for uh, RKCOM. So civil information management, that's how the sausage gets made with the information. It's going to be uh, like civil knowledge integration is kind of moving forward, the new term. If you want to take just real quick one minute, just kind of talking how that helps out the two in the fight. I'll be briefer than that. Uh, what we were finding is that there's so much information that getting the right piece of information at the right time to influence maneuver we weren't effective in that, uh, and I, I suspect that the, the grand gentleman to follow is going to talk a little bit more about that point. So if, if you look at that, that kind of pyramid of knowledge at the bottom, you've got data, then you structure it, you turn it into information, which is great. There's a lot of that. But then you have to apply expert analysis to it to turn it into knowledge that's actually useful for your mission and what you're doing. That's the sweet spot. And then at the top level is system understanding where you can, you know, analytically predict outcomes and things are going to happen. We almost never get there in the human space, but we want to be in that knowledge space. The challenge is that we do not have the tools or the training pipeline to get us there. So there's a lot of talk at proponency and in other places to figure out how we're going to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. And does anybody need another minute to write that down? I, I see some of our brothers writing. You good? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sweat MSO. We talked about that. Bottom line, it's got to be from the beginning and throughout the entire of the operations. And I'll show you guys the next slide of kind of how I depict it. It's a tool that's worked well for me. Uh, once again, so a deliberate assessment is something that I plan. I want to go out and do a, an assessment of this bridge or this key piece of terrain. Hasty is kind of what they did in Battle Fallujah. You know, they're driving around trying to figure the problem out. They come across that bridge. You know, they see there's an issue with the water. They make a rapid assessment. Also very critical for the fight. And then we talked about civil military uh, you know, interaction on the NATO side, we're going to call that civil engagement on our side. Same thing. Here's an example of how you can depict sweat MSO, just a technique, whatever your baseline is going to be for the amber, green, red, or black, and, you know, by population center. Uh, it's kind of a wave top, but it's a way to show the commander a graphic representation of what's going on in his battle space. Okay, transitional government operations. Uh, Serena, we talked about it. I don't want to be in the business of it, but you know what? We have a responsibility of it if it happens. So our doctrine has changed. 
Uh, so the CA now has some more authority to go ahead and conduct a transition. Once again, I don't want to be in that business of it, but if I break it, I buy it, and I've got to go ahead and have something to stabilize it in the interim. So these are kind of the DOD directives that govern that. And then informal versus formal. Uh, Stu had talked about it, some very good points. Humans are humans. We come up with society and structure no matter where we're at in the world. And regardless if it's formal and it's got a constitution or you know, there's an informal bylaw with that organization, there's rules and there's structure. We all need that for stability. You have to understand that. You have to embrace it no matter where we are in the world. And we have to make sure that there's something there. If not, we get a power vacuum and then we're going to have national security objectives that aren't going to be met. People are going to die and it's going to create issues from years to come. So we have to understand both that and respect it and embrace it. I just have one question. Yes, ma'am. Who's responsible from the planning lens? Who's responsible to negotiate evacuation of civilians with the other side? Because it's not the responsibility of the humanitarian organization. G9, ma'am. So it's, it is you. Guys. That is me. I own that. You would have to. I own that 100%. And that's where, ma'am, the sync matrix and having the CMOC up and working uh, deconfliction. Adversary to get civilians out of the area. Well, if I work with PSYOP, I'll put messages out to kind of work at that side of it. Yeah, there has to be that interface, not the, yeah, you can do the leaflets, but sometimes you actually have to negotiate the terms of the evacuation. Good example, ma'am, is uh, General, General Mattis, ma'am. So Fallujah, General Mattis, the CMOC, he'd come to the CMOC. He would have the, you know, he'd have basically the enemy come out to the CMOC and he would tell him. Okay. Knock the stuff off. When well, they had the uh, the Blackwater uh, gentlemen, you know, that sadly were killed, he told, "Knock this shit off." You know, bottom line. If not, I'm going to come in there and we're going to handle business. But I'm saying, you know, moving civilians from, like in Ukraine, what's mm -hmm. happening? Like Russia had to negotiate with Ukraine to get civilians out. So who who does the commander task to? Undertake those negotiations, ma'am. Metsy, whoever the commander would task, but probably is going to be at a high level. It will be that commander, ma'am. Okay. okay. Sar, we use we work through interlocutors. So with Department of State, U, UN, and others, <laughs> there is a pipeline that we do in our gym piece, where if the scheme of maneuver requires humanitarian quarters be established, which has to be acknowledged and approved by the yeah. international community. We have a pipeline to do it, so there's an interlocutor process there. And I would host nation too, ma'am. I mean, obviously, I know you got a lot of experience on it. If I've got reliable host nation, I would want to use the host nation if I could. You know, their police and their forces. Uh, Money is a weapon system. Just the highlights. It can be incredibly effective. It can be incredibly detrimental depending on how you use it. So the key is accountability. Um, I'll kind of talk more about it, but there was the $33 million gas station uh, in Afghanistan that somebody had built on the Department of State side. Frivolous waste of money. You know, there was no purpose for it. So CERP fund is something that you'll see. Uh, the JAG is going to tell me what I can and can't do. He's going to dictate those terms. And you have different stuff that we can kind of go ahead and utilize as well for uh, just kind of Band-Aid fixes. Uh, ODACA is a Department of State fund that's uh, kind of coordinated through a system called OASIS. And that's typically for... I gray area uh, operation. So overseas deployment training operation in the Philippines. I want to help out and build some schools in support of Balakatan. I would use something like an ODACA fund. But once again, we have to understand the second, third order effect. We need to put a host nation face to it and as often as we can. And we have to understand historical failures. Trash programs, for example, in Iraq. Okay, great. People are getting more money picking up trash than opening up their own businesses again. So what do they do? They picked up trash, they got money from the government, and they went home and they, you know, that was their job. We didn't help stimulate the economy like we want it. So we have to have a good baseline assessment and it's got to be continuous and you have to have divergent thinkers in the room. I want to have that specialist that goes, hey, sir, that is a stupid idea and here's why. And I've got to be open-minded enough to go, you know what? School me up. What do you got? And look at it from that angle. So I think within our communities as planners and above, we have to listen to divergent thinkers. I think that's incredibly critical so we don't get tunnel vision. Um, here's a picture of $33 million. And was a total waste of money. It cost the Afghani $700 to change their cars from petrol to natural gas. There was no way they were going to do it. So nobody had done the research on it. There was no accountability. That was $33 million. God bless. American contractors. Think about how much money that, I mean, that could have been spent in so many different ways. So, worse examples, too. And there's worse. But this is what I would look at. So this is my opinion. Genuine need. Does the host nation actually want it? Is it feasible? Very credible. Sustainable. Is it going to break? Uh, the part system, how elaborate does it have to be? I want a Band-Aid fix. I don't want to do anything that's going to be uh, above board. I want to do what is a host nation standard, and I want to repair what's broken. That's my intent. Nothing further, nothing more. And then post-assessment. The accountability of it is incredibly critical. Coordination with SIOP, once again, SIOP approval sucks. So any core level approval, anything strategic, so using uh, Instagram, Telegram, division commander can't approve that. It's got to go up to core. So I've got to make sure that I'm integrating early with 
with a lot of these coordinations with PSYOP to make sure the message gets out. And then PAO, I mean, technically can influence, but PAO can put some stuff out as well to help out. Uh. <laughs> Any questions so far as we're kind of going through? Okay. <clears throat> yes, sir. <laughs> For, uh... That $33 gas station thing, did that become like a front range criminal warfare activity or was that just like a... No, but it's, no, I don't so much that, but what does it show the local populace? We're stupid. We're going to spend money and you know what, you can come up with some bullshit reason of why I need money and we might hand out cash. And then we lose credibility. And then too, I mean, think of $33 million in Afghanistan. I mean, go buy goats. I mean, go buy, uh, help out with some well projects or some basic stuff. But, uh, you know, and the problem is you get people to go in there, we're going to build it like Western standards. And why are you looking at it from that lens? It doesn't make any sense. So that's a good question. Have you ever seen the NXL leverage in a war game? Not so much. Uh, not so much. And the problem is, too, civilian consideration in the war games. Here's the biggest thing I've seen. I know you came back from Fifth Corps. They plan for civilian considerations at all levels, you know, CTCs, war fighters. But the problem is, like we talked about on the tactical level, they're trying to figure out how to fight on a core level. And I mean, I know, Brother Bert, you could talk more about it from being out there, Fifth Corps graph. You know, they are having a hard time with just their standards, going through their SOPs and just working through staff process. Here's what will happen. They'll have a, a measle inject. So measle inject, if you haven't done a war fighter, it's kind of a Excel spreadsheet that says at this time this is going to happen. So they'll have a measle inject for you know 10,000 IDPs moving through the battle space. But if the core is having such a hard time operating, okay, Rio stat effect. Uh, IDPs, they just went through the battle space, they're fine, they've gone back home. So the problem is civilian consideration, they'll really use it as a Rio stat in the operation, and they don't really get a lot of practice on it, even though they might try to plan for it. So you know what, I'll, let's see, well, we'll just ad lib it. So IDPs, the idea that I want you to understand with IDPs, um, it's gonna be a problem in your battle space. You're gonna have an influx of IDPs trying to get out of the battle space when you're going through operations in urban environment. So a simple way of doing it is having checkpoints far back from the fighting if you can to collect them and then get them off the battle space. Early coordination with our NGO brothers and sisters before for resourcing is important. I wanna get them back to a collection center from that checkpoint. Now, my team on the ground, hopefully I'm not taken from maneuver. It's going to be MPs, PSYOP, CA. They're trying to own that part of the fight and get those IDPs off the battle space. Medical treatment is very important. So I already mentioned that. Concrete injury, stuff like that, if they're not handled soon, can lead to death or other issues. So having those medical teams closer to the front is incredibly critical to go ahead and provide that treatment. And then an urban environment, where would you want to put a bunch of IDPs in an urban environment, if you could, depending on where the fighting's at? Stadiums all day long. Stadiums all day long. LA, if we had IDP issues here, I'd find the stadium farthest away from the fight and try to get them out that way. Infrastructure's already there. There's hopefully, if power's still good, they've got basic needs met. Um, to me, that's the most critical. Let's see if I can try to. It depends on the pace of the operation, right? It does. So yeah, pace of operation. Then, once again, I mean, if we're going to be going to that area, I don't want to have IDPs in that stadium. And can I feasibly get them there? I mean, one of the big events of urban warfare that has caused major failures is mass casualties. Yes, sir. So don't put a bunch of civilians in a place which becomes a mass casualty event. Yes, sir. It's all good. We'll go forth. Okay, so IDPs. That's a big consideration. Sir had a good point talking about uh, mass cal considerations. Infrastructure, can I get them basically out of the area as efficiently as I can? And then can I work with the host nation to go ahead and run that actual IDP camp? We don't want to be in the business of running an IDP camp. The amount of resource that's going to require from U.S. force and from the G4, S4, and logistics is going to be massive. It's not something that I want to get in the practice of having to do. So I'll tell you, with that, I'll stop it from here. Um, any questions going forward for the group? Um, I open the floor up to anybody who has any questions, questions, concerns. Here's the big conclusion that I want to put to everybody. Integration is the key. You have to have integration right off the bat. Civil considerations are complex, they're dynamic. We have to do that right off the bat. Other piece of it is I have to understand the commander's objectives. I have to understand what maneuver wants to accomplish and how can I help them accomplish that piece of it. And I've got to make sure that I'm doing the right stuff by doing good civil reconnaissance and I'm updating and sharing that information throughout the board and working with our NATO partners. Yes, sir. I'll go one further and say that you have to be integrated early. So like on the target working groups, 
you're a part of it when we're doing the manoeuvre through the uh, through the rural areas. You've also got like the um, the cross-functional teams to sort of follow up behind and they can do a little bit of damage repair for where an ABCT is trashed a load of crops and things like that. Yeah. And they're, as you said, money the other side. They're good sensors for what's going on forwards as well. Hmm. So it's not just as you hit the urban areas, like, fuck, where am I see it? Like, um, but you're integrating them nice and early and, and getting a good feed into all of the uh, cross it's critical and then the other piece of it too it's that integration with all the stats i understand what that s2g2 needs you know i'm not going to colonel chang with a bunch of information that's useless i've taken all that information you know brian's boiled it down i can give him something that's a so what bottom line up front to help him out understand the fight and help him understand the atmospherics in the area same thing with the g4s4 how am i helping him out by one minimizing and the stuff he has to go ahead and provide, he can focus on providing combat power, but then as well, understanding that infrastructure, whether it's the rail system or different things that can help. One point I want to, oh, yes, please. No, just finish your thought now. Yeah, so the one thing on the IDPs, we talk about it. In the perfect world, the second battle of Fallujah was amazing. They got folks out, they got everybody down to about 1,000 IDPs in the area. I don't care what we message, people are going to stay. Now, every country has an emergency response disaster plan. We need to understand that early and understand how that affects us and what resources are already pre-positioned. All, many countries, including everybody in the room, has a great plan. And they've got resources already allocated. They've got summit guys that understand that. We can work with our partners to go ahead and provide that aid. NGOs the same way as well. So sheltering in place, you know, we come across folks that are sheltering in place What's our plan? We have to make sure that we can do something to go ahead and help out those in consideration. Yes, ma'am. Just very briefly, since Ron mentioned mass casualties, and I sort of mentioned this on and off uh, this week, really studying adversary TTPs are so important in the, and it's a constant learning throughout the military operations because you can have an ID attack far away from the front line, but there's a lot of evidence where the other side has bombed ID camps. Uh, and depending again, you need to know their intent and their intent is to cause mass casualties and punish the population and terrorize the population. You see, in Ukraine, we saw it in Syria. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's good feedback. 